It's understandably taken me a long time to make this video, but now that our dear friend Brian Griffin has been laid to rest, I feel I'm ready to talk about it. So right now, at the time of this recording, today is March the 2nd, 2024, and our dear friend and my business partner, Brian Griffin, passed away peacefully at his London flat on the 27th of January, 2024. So that's just been over a month ago. Brian was laid to rest in a town called Lye in accordance with his wishes, and that is in the Midlands of England. So I just want to use this opportunity just to talk a little bit about Brian. I mean, not like everything I do, no, this is not scripted. This is just, I guess you could say straight from the heart. And I did obviously make the announcement on my social media um, when Brian passed. Um, we did it in such a way. I, I've, I've tried very hard and indeed myself and everyone as part of the inner circle um, to be as dignified and as sensitive as this possible as we could be in this and um, my heart is broken <laughs> I can gut it I I think I, I I had a chance to grieve only recently where it just really hit me that he's not here I and that really hit me the other day when I was going through my phone and I was going through some voicemails and I, you know, I listened to his voice and, and I, th you know, and it was like, hello, young Vaughan, you know, he always called, he always called everyone young. That was his thing. Young Vaughan, young, young John, young Sarah, whoever you were, he'd always put a young in front of your name. And that was such an endearing thing because uh, in the pub where we used to drink, sometimes there, you know, these very old people come in, like they were much older than him. There'd be a guy called Jimmy, and he'd go, hello, young Jimmy. And everyone was young. He always called everyone young. And I actually had him on my phone as young Brian. Listening to his voicemail and then realizing I, I, I couldn't call him back, it, 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 just really, it, it just really hit home. And I guess, you know, those of you who follow me know that I have now since I have recently left the UK last year and I've moved to Estonia. And I think that has has helped somewhat because moving back here in a different environment, I was able to, in, in some ways, detach. Um, because I think it would be it would be very difficult for me if I was still living in London. And for those of you who've been following me and you know know the channel, and if you're part of this community, you will know that Brian and I lived in the same building. <laughs> we were neighbours, and I want to talk a little bit about that and go into some detail that I've never really made public before. Obviously, you know, just with within telling you as far as I can within reason. Um, so when I started my YouTube channel about five years ago, I embarked on this Depeche Mode album review series, as you guys know. And the funny thing was, Brian actually lived in the building that I lived in. Um, we used to live in, I used to live in Rotherhithe, and, and, and so did Brian. And to cut a long story short, I'd started my channel, and I think I had about a thousand, maybe I got to a point where I had about 4,000 subscribers. And because I was doing this album review series, it made sense to bring Brian in to, you know, to jump in on the series. But I was a little bit apprehensive and I was a bit nervous to ask him because uh, at this stage you know I'd known Brian since about since I moved into uh, the the residence where we lived and I'd moved into that building in about 2012 so I'd, I'd always known Brian um, but I you know and, and and we did talk a bit and stuff but I, I just didn't feel like you know that he would come onto my channel and talk about Depeche Mode but Anyway, all I had to do was ask, and he was completely up for it right from the onset. And, you know, the rest is history. You can see all the videos here on my channel. And I think with Brian and I, there was always a great, great chemistry, something something that could not be fabricated. I think we had this real sort of like father-son relationship or, you know, or like, like he was an uncle. And he really took me under his wing. And, it, you know, it, it was a magical, magical 
um, friendship. And the interesting thing is, you know, when I first brought Brian onto the the episode, I remember making an announcement, hey guys, I'm going to be interviewing Brian Griffin, the Depeche Mode photographer. And <laughs> the moment I brought him on, the, you know, the, the comments after that, people were going, oh my God, how, how are you doing this? Wow. And Brian did help me a lot with my channel because Brian was like, he was like the very first sort of big name that came onto my channel. And of course, if you're in this YouTube game, you'll know you go from strength to strength. You interview Brian and then it makes it easier for you to interview other people because when you reach out to other people, you can say, hey, I've interviewed Brian Griffin, you know. And and so he re it really helped. You know, there was the snowball effect. But he was always very, very gracious. And I remember the first time he came to my my flat where I used to film my, my, my first videos, it was a very modest setup, and I remember him showing up with these sunglasses, you know, he, he, these shades, because I think he was he was doing the whole rock and roll thing. And I was very sort of polite with him back in those days, and <laughs> we sat down to film, and I was really thinking he was going to take his glasses off. And instead of just asking him, Brian, take your glasses off, I think uh, while I was setting the lights up, I said, Brian, are the lights too right and he went no no young Vaughn just just carry on <laughs> and this was the beginning of a beautiful uh, friendship and which eventually became a business partnership uh, as you all know um, we started a a poster print business selling Depeche Mode artwork through my channel uh, and, and to make it we made it accessible to the to the fans which we called uh, poster prints for the masses and uh, it was a great way to you know make the artwork accessible to the masses but um, I kid you not it was also a great way you know it was an income for me and an income for Brian and you know it helped support this channel and then everything just spurred from there I think what I wanted to do was I always wanted to share Brian with especially the Depeche Mode community because a lot of people had seen Brian on interviews and stuff and you know he he conducted his interviews with such gr with such grace and elo eloquence and a little bit of humor and dry sarcasm and but with a lot of class and I think a lot of people would look at those videos and think oh they they would they would probably feel that they would feel intimidated to meet Brian but of course the way I knew Brian and certainly we had a uh, there is a pub just next to where we used to live called the Blacksmith's Arms in Rotherhouse Street it's a great pub and Brian, that was his local pub. And, you know, I would occasionally pop in. And the funny thing was, Brian was such such a man of the people. I've used this term before. You know, when you look at the way, when you look at the way Brian looked at the world, I, I'd i sometimes look at him when we were talking and just look at his eyes. And I, 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 would, try, I would try to think, and, you know, I think, what are you seeing? You know, this is a man who could photograph a potato in black and white and make it look interesting. He clearly saw the world in a completely different way. And I did think to myself once that when I went to an exhibition and I saw all his work on the wall and it was there in grand, you know, technical and these, you know, these huge framed pieces. And I'd look at them and go, it once dawned on me, he had a mind of the gods. You know, he had a mind like a god. But at the same time, he was a man of the people. And that is something I always try to bring to people's attention on my channel. And that is why we did meet and greets. And I won't take credit for anything, but something that I think I did bring to the community was, was to show people how how down to earth and how just what a great guy he was. I can't tell you how many times after several events or, you know, sometimes I would bring Brian onto, you know, Zoom chats where he could communicate with Depeche Mode fans and they could ask him questions. You know, that had never been done before. And the correspondence and the feedback I got after these events were always so positive. People would always say things like, oh my God, he's so nice. And, and of course, when people met him, They'd say, oh, he's so normal. And he was. And I, I, I've, I've said it before, mind of the gods, man of the people. Because he was really a man of the people. And if you look at his history, which is vast and various and, and you know, wonderful. He was from a small 
town in the black country. I mean, he had such a humble, humble upbringing. I mean, he is, by all means, I think what we say, a self-made man. You know, he 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 just did all the hard, difficult jobs as a young kid, and he he really did it all himself. And something that gave him the edge was not only his ability to see the world in a different way to to what to, to what I'm sure you and I see it. He he could clearly see things that we couldn't. And but alongside that, he had this brilliant, brilliant mind. He had this real engineering brain. Now he did talk about I think he wanted to study engineering, but here's the thing. I know a lot of artistic people and I don't want to generalize here. You know, we talk about people whose brains are left hemisphere and you get people who are right hemisphere brains. And, you know, the left part of the brain is apparently, you know, logic and reasoning. And the right hand side of the brain is, you know, creativity and all that stuff. And, you know, generally speaking, I think they always like to say that, uh, you know, creative people, we're more right hand hemisphere people. I think with Brian, he, he, he had this edge because he obviously was a very creative right-hand hemisphere kind of guy but he also had this incredible mind this really intelligent rational calculating mind and I would be in his presence sometimes and the way he could the way he could look at something and then just form a calculation like if, if you know if he was photographing something or you know, he, he would do a measurement in his head and go, okay, now that's so so much divided by so and so, blah blah blah. And he could, you know, he could adjust the the aperture. And okay, I know nothing about photography, but he could really work those things out in his mind. And so he he not only had this incredible creative mind and soul and sense of being, but he also had this incredibly genius, logical sort of engineering mind. And and that's the best way I could could explain it. Whatever the combination and whatever the, and whatever the factors that made up Brian Griffin, he was a genius. And I know the word genius is a word that, you know, kind of gets thrown about a lot. But he, by all intensive means, was a genius. So many things I could say. I mean, this I could I could do a whole series on this, and I may in future. Um, but. I just feel so blessed and so privileged that I that I got to meet him and I got to spend so much time with him. You know, working in the building, I haven't, this isn't common knowledge, but the building I used to work in, I used to, in the beginning, I used to be the handyman. I was the maintenance man. I would, you know, I was the guy you called if your boiler didn't work. Yeah, <laughs> I'd go and fix your boiler. I would paint flats. I would... I used to maintain the garden and the fish ponds and, you know, if, if the garage gates broke in the building, I was the guy who went and fixed them. And so, I mean, in hindsight, this would have been very interesting for a video series. But what a lot of you don't know was when, for instance, when I was filming Brian for, you know, content for the channel, I would I would arrive at his flat with my, my you know, my cameras and then we'd do the video and then he'd go, oh, Vaughn, uh, when we finished with this, could you change my light bulbs? And so this was funny. So there were many times where I would, we'd film a video and then afterwards we'd have a drink or before that I would, you know, paint his flat or, you know, f uh, put a light bulb in or, 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 or fix something that was broken in his flat. And because I was the handyman, uh, it's not something that I've shared with many people because, it, you know, it's not, that wasn't, that story wasn't really relevant, but I just think now if, if, if people had, if, if I had filmed more of that, I just think it could have been, it could have been so interesting. But then again, that was, that was all just private stuff. Brian was so interesting to talk to. You know, life is short and I, I made a commitment to myself a while ago not to waste my time. And Brian was just one of the most interesting souls you could ever meet in your life. It's like I would often go to his flat and, you know, we'd just sit and have some tea. And uh, and just just the stories he would tell in passing. He, I just felt, God, I, I just felt I wanted to record everything he said because he was just so interesting. And there are so many fascinating stories. But one of the things I'm most proud of is the, there are many things we did, but the Mode book, which we released 
last year is something that I'm so proud of. Brian was very proud of it as well. He, you know, when it came out, I think, I think he he thought he thought it was one of the most successful things he'd ever, he'd ever done. Um, the idea popped into my head one day when I was sitting having tea with him, and you know, I just said, Brian, why haven't why haven't you done a Depeche Mode photography book? And and anyway, you know, we we went on that journey. We it was a hell of a hell of a hell of a book. Um, I'm very proud of it. The story itself about that book was incredible hard work because we decided we were going to do the whole thing ourselves. We were going to self-publish. Um, so we did everything, absolutely everything. But I'm so glad that towards the end, I cannot tell you how hard this period was because I think in hindsight, if I, if I had, if I could have done things differently, I would have probably got some people to help, like some staff or something. But we decided we were going to do this ourselves and it became a very, very stressful thing. And there's, there are so many stories I can tell you about that. But some of the few things that sprung to mind was we decided that when the stock arrived, we would get together nine o'clock every morning at Brian's flat in his studio and we would start dispatching the books. And it was very, very hard. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but, um, and we did that, you know, every single day until they were all dispatched, just the two of us. And uh, some personal issues which made it very difficult for me was my daughter and my wife I had just sent off to Estonia because I was leaving the UK. So you can imagine, you know, moving house is one of the most stressful things you can ever do. But I was moving country. And so my my, my wife and my daughter were away and I was still in, in London, you know, still trying to get all the, all the, all our goods shipped over to Estonia at the same time embarking on this, you know, this book project, which was, and of course I was suffering from the long COVID as you guys. <laughs> anyway, I'm not trying to put the butter on thick, but it was really, really hell. And there were some really, really golden moments <laughs> in Brian's flat. I mean, he's a lot more of a pacifist than I am. I'm, I can be quite hot headed um, as I think, <laughs> Most of my friends will know, not in an not in an aggressive way or a violent way, but um, yeah, I'm very much about getting stuff done, and I was really driving this project, and and Brian just, it was just so funny. If you could have been a fly on the wall in that situation where Brian and I were dispatching books, taking orders, and it was hard work, and I had to have it all done within six weeks because I was leaving to Estonia, and it was so funny that sometimes when I was upstairs printing the labels brian would be downstairs packing the books and signing them and sometimes he'd walk around going oh solomio and he'd like he'd be like singing it but this is what i loved about him he had this real sort of like childlike um <laughs> he had this real childlike approach uh, to, to everything he 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 not only was incredibly thoughtful and serious but he had this really childlike sense of humor which and and we could you know left to our own devices sometimes we would come up with the most childish jokes i mean if thank god we weren't filming but we we were like two naughty schoolboys. it was so so funny and and those sessions while you know dispatching the mode book went from moments of stress to extreme hysterical giggling and there were times when i was busy saying okay brian where did you put this and okay and then sometimes i'd say brian I think it's time for you to go for your walk because Brian was well known. He'd always go for his walk every day and, and he'd be, I've just been for a walk, young Vaughn. I'd be like, well, go for another one. And sometimes I was like really ratty <laughs> anyway. And he'd walk out and he'd go out and do his walk and I'd carry on dispatching the books and, you know, doing the labels and all the other stressful stuff. And then about half an hour later, I'd get a call. Hello, Brian. Oh, oh hi, young Vaughn. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just out at the moment. Um, have you eaten? I'd be like, no, I haven't. Oh, bless him. And he came back once and he cooked me the most delicious bangers and mash. You know, and I can't I can't tell you this. When he cooked the bangers and mash and I was upstairs and he said, Vaughn, it's ready. You know, he had gone to such attention to detail. You know, it was the most, it was the best mustard. He had heated the plates. I remember him going to the market and he would, he would, he would buy these big organic apples and he would say to me, have you eaten today, Vaughn? He really took good care of me. And there was, there was, and an, <laughs> this is really heartbreaking to say, but there, there was, there was one time he, during, 
the dispatching of the the Depeche Mode books, Brian had he had a week booked off, so he went off. So that meant I had to you know dispatch books for from by myself for for about a week. And I remember coming to his flat that morning, and and obviously he had left. And I walked in, and there was an apple on the table, a big organic apple with a posted note, with an arrow pointing to it, saying "Eat." And that. <laughs> That really nearly brought me to tears. Things like that. He really, really cared about me. And, and you know, I had my diva moments while we were dispatching the books. I'm not going to go into detail about the problems we had. You know, problems happen. But it was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books. And as I was packing these books and stuff, and sometimes he'd say, Vaughn, would you like a tea? I'd be like, yes. And then one day I was in such a foul mood. I said, Brian, I'm not a tea drinker. I'm a coffee drinker. I was, you know, I was being a bitch anyway. And I kid you not, the next morning when I came to his flat, he had bought a coffee grinder and coffee beans. Yeah. And (laughs) I remember coming in that morning to his flat and he said, young Vaughn, I've bought you a croissant. And we had beautiful French croissant from a local bakery. And he said, I'm going to make you some coffee. And he went over to the coffee machine and then he picked up the bag and he went, oh no, these are beans. I need to buy a grinder. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to go on a tangent, but the next day a grinder arrived and he he then embarked on making me fresh coffee every morning and he started drinking coffee as well. And, uh, you know, this was such a beautiful time and it, 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 it it's something, it's a time I'll never get back, but it is something no one can ever take away from me was that time that 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 all that stress and you know during the dispatching of the mode books but all i you know at the time it was stressful but all i'm left with now is a feeling of absolute pride and, and joy and I'm, I'm so so grateful i'm so so grateful so once we finally got all the the mode books dispatched I moved off to Estonia and I arrived here in Estonia on the 1st of November, 2023. And I would still phone Brian. We'd probably speak twice a week. I think Brian really, I think it was hard for him, the fact that I left. It was hard for me too. He he did say things like, oh, you'll be back. I, I don't think he ever wanted me to leave and I don't think he ever thought I would. And I can tell you when I said goodbye to Brian, the the uh, night of the pub, we were in the Blacksmith's Arms pub. I was at the pub with Brian. We had just sent off the last few books and we were sitting down and having a pint and just sort of like, yeah, it was we're just sort of like avoiding the goodbye. But at the end, when it eventually became time to say goodbye, I remember just walking up to him and he was <laughs> he was sitting at the bar. And I just, I just hugged him. And I just hugged him, and there, there was, there was nothing I, could, <laughs> there was, there was nothing more I could say. I just hugged him, and I, I, I always used to kiss, kiss, kiss him on the head. I kissed him on the head, and I said, "I love you." And, and I just turned and walked out. And then, as I walked out, I walked to the door, and I just turned to look back at him and I just saw him sitting like this and I I just walked off. I just left and I um that that broke my heart. The next morning I got onto a plane and I flew to Estonia and that was the first of November. But we kept in touch. I would speak to him almost every day. Hello, young Brian. How's it going? And yeah, we still had a. We were still dealing with the mode book, and you know, we still had the poster print business going, and there was a lot that had to be done. And I was setting things up here in Europe, you know, to expand our business and stuff. And there was there, there was so much more we had to we had to do. We there was so much more we, uh, as I said, so much so much more we wanted to do. Sometimes. Brian and I in conversations, Brian would joke about, oh, Vaughn, I'm an old man. I'm not going to be around for much longer. And I would always go, 
Brian, you're going to outlive me. And and I I, th- I think there was a lot of, in my heart, I just felt that I could still see myself showing up at him, uh, you know, at, at, at his flat when he was 90 and, you know, to film another documentary or something about Depeche Mode, some of the unseen stuff. And I just, you know, I just, I, I just feel, you know, he passed away at the age of 75 and, you know, a lot of people don't get to that age, but I still feel that we were kind of cheated just because, you know, I still feel that there was so much more to say, but as I said, so much more to say, but so much had already been said. So we did talk probably every second day, and I was planning to come back to the UK in January 2024. As I did, um, I was doing a, a, a UK little mini UK tour with the band that I'm in called Mesh, and I flew out to Scotland, I think on the 17th of January, and then we did our shows in Glasgow, and then Manchester, and then London, and then I was going to come back and then go to, Brian was doing a project with a gentleman called Kia for his wine company, and um, it was very beautiful what Kia had done with Brian, because it was It was almost like a celebration of Brian's work without having it necessarily attached to certain artists. Like with me, you know, we always talked about Depeche Mode, but this, this, what Keir was doing was, was great because it was, it was, it was more about Brian's artwork on, you know, on on its own merit. And uh, I went to that private evening um, um, on the, uh, it was on the Tuesday. On the, that was the 22nd, I think, yeah, the 22nd of January. And I went to that, and I hadn't seen Brian since I'd left for Estonia, uh, you know, the previous year. And I was shocked when I saw him because he seemed different. He seemed to have lost a lot of weight. He looked really pale. He looked really gaunt. And and I thought to myself, okay, maybe he's just a little bit tired. And to cut a long story short, when when Brian made the speech that night at this event, there was something different about him. Brian was a master. He was a master at making speeches. He was very, very good. If ever you watched his speeches, he would really walk that fine line between being confident, cocky, and funny. You know, something he may have said was something like, oh, well, they were just photographers and I wasn't a real artist. You know, things like that. And, and he had the right to do that, you know. His speeches were always the perfect combination of balance between humility and confidence. And sometimes he'd step his toe into a little bit of arrogance. And I was like, yes, Brian. But this um, this last speech I saw him make, it was almost like he was um, presenting his eulogy. He was so he was so overwhelmed and overcome by the emotion in the in the beautiful surroundings of this, you know, this 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 exhibition hall situation. And he um when he was making his speech, I was waiting for those sort of quirky little jokes to come out, and they they never came. He was very, he sort of, as he was talking, he sort of like kept looking up and sort of like spinning around and saying, he said something like, and I'm just paraphrasing now, something like, I'm so glad that I was chosen, I was given this great uh, talent, w- w- whatever vessel chose me to, you know, to produce this work. He, he was basically saying that everything he'd done was from, that something came through him and it wasn't him that was doing it. You know, he was just completely humble and he ended the speech. I was waiting for like a joke or a punchline, but it never came. He was just completely humbled and overwhelmed. I I, I don't know what it was, but I, I, I don't, I don't recall saying this, but I remember at the end of that, at the end of that, that evening, I walked up to him and I hugged him and I always kissed him on the head and I, I walked. I walked over to Kia, his his lovely wife Tracy, and apparently I said to her, and to Kia, I said to them both, "Please take good care of him." And then I walked away. Um, I don't. Even, I don't even remember saying that, but they told me that later on, and and it'll become relevant when I tell you. I then went home. It was a very emotional evening. I was very proud and very tired. You know, we'd just done those shows and everything, so. 
I did speak to him briefly the next day and we were planning to meet up the Monday, you know, the, because we just wanted to you know, just hang out and tie up some loose ends and, you know, talk about the business. And then to cut a long story short, Thursday came, I called him again, I think, and then he didn't answer. Friday came, called him, he didn't answer. And part of me wishes I had sort of gone out to, you know, to his studio to go and see him at his flat. But I was staying in North London at the time. And I also thought, okay, look, he's got a lot on. Just just, just back off, Vaughan. You don't need to. But then Saturday morning came. This was the, the 27th of January. And I called him and he didn't answer. And then I got a phone call from Ravi. Ravi is... Uh, also one of Brian's so-called, Brian also used to refer to him as his adopted son. Rabbi was his photographic assistant. Rabbi's a very, very beautiful soul, a very, very good man. And when Ravi phoned me and said, Vaughn, have you heard from Brian? Then I knew there was something wrong because, he, you know, people started calling me and then calling Ravi. And I just thought if he's not speaking to, if he's not answering my calls and Ravi's calls, something must be wrong. So I jumped onto the phone I uh, spoke to a, a dear friend and artist of ours who's called Gavin, who also lives in the building. I phoned him and I said, look, you need to get to Ryan's flat and go and have a look. Gavin's a grown man. I didn't want to you know, explain to him what to do. But I said to him, as soon as you get to the flat, and you, you know, can you please just call me? And then after not hearing, and, and, and then I hung up and... Um, I didn't hear anything for about 20 minutes, but, th- but then I knew my gut feeling just was, was that he passed away. And um, I'm not going to go into any detail uh, beyond that. Um, I got the news that he passed away, but I mean, I was already, while this was all happening, I was dressing and getting myself ready and jumping onto the bus. I was staying in North London where my brother lives and I was rushing back. And it was while, whilst I was back in the bus, on the bus, I got the news and... When I got to Brian's flat, there were some of the inner circle people there, the, the Brian's closest, uh, the police, everyone were there. I, you know, we all decided that, you know, we need to keep this private. We don't want the information getting out. Um, it was just Brian's cl- closest inner circle there. And the first and um, first and foremost was to, you know, make sure the next of kin know and things like that. And, you know, we had a list of who to contact and stuff. And then I just went upstairs to where Brian was in his bed and I asked the police if I could go in there and if I could just sit with him for a while. And, you know, we all die. I think we all know this. I hate to be morbid, but we all know that we're going to die. We're going to lose loved ones. But it's the way we lose them that is sometimes that sometimes makes death so hard to deal with. And I just want to say that this was one of the most beautiful passings you could want for a friend or a loved one. I walked into the room. He was lying in his bed with his pajamas. And he looked like he was sleeping. He just passed away in his sleep. And I sat down beside the bed his his one hand was clasped like this I put my hand on it I said a prayer Um, and I said you know Brian (laughs) there's so much we still had to there was so much we still had to there was so much more we had to do and I've I, 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 I said There is so much we have to say, but so much has already been said. And then I'm not going to go into more detail, but I I thanked him for everything. I kissed him on his head. And I said goodbye. And I walked out. I have no regrets. I just think part of me feels cheated, not for a selfish way. Not me, but I, I, I sometimes feel the world is kind of cheated. Uh, it's just 
there was so much more that he wanted to do. He started working on a Echo and the Bunnyman book. I think the Mode book, he was really excited about that. And he just wasn't going to stop. You know, he'd done this wine project with Kia for the Neo, Neo Tempo wines. And he just didn't show any signs of slowing down. His work was his first love. Brian's work was his first love. He loved his work. He lived for his work. And I think the way he went was just perfect. From seeing him the last time at that exhibition, he just seemed overcome by emotion. Maybe he knew, I don't know. But he he lived his life full. And he, you know, who knows about the afterlife and things like that. I don't know what your beliefs are. But sometimes people say, we go when we're ready. And I think he maybe just put his head down that night and he just thought, my work here is done. What a beautiful legacy. What a wonderful, what a life. I want to thank you for sharing this with me. This has been quite a sort of like therapeutical. <laughs> um, but of course, there's so much more I could have said. An incredible soul. And I want to thank everyone here as part of this community who supported Brian and I. It was the kindness and everything that I you know, received from this community that's really, it's really helped me. And it's only now that I felt I could talk about this. But I'd like to share with you now a, a song which I've written for Brian. Um, I recorded it. It was very difficult to record just under the, under the emotion. Please share this with me and thank you. There is no other way for me to say thank you. Gray sky over golden fields. Did God take you too soon? So much I wanted to say But so much already said Your story has been told Still my heart aches And will I see you again In the wheat fields of gold There is no other way for me to tell you I love you. Oh, inspired by your vision, the lands of life you took me through. Eyes of an angel Lay your brilliant head to rest So much already said Your story has been told
much I wanted to say But so much already said Now your story has been told Still my heart aches And will I see you again In the wheat fields of gold Close your eyes and sleep, my friend Story told, all things must end Mind of the gods, man of the people Sail away I'll walk with you again in golden fields under silver skies in perfect light mind of the gods man of the people I'll see you Sleep, my friend Story told All things must end Till we walk again In the golden fields Under silver skies In perfect light There is no other way. Hey, 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 hey.